Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this session. Please be aware that this team together has trans, um, transitioned this low performing Title I at risk elementary school into a high achieving and flourishing Nevada report card five star school, Nevada Governor's STEM School, and Magnet Schools of America National Dem Demonstration School, STEAM School. Um, they bring together a team of dynamic staff, business partners, valued parent guardians, and extended families to structure and create a thriving environment and educational model of excellence, ensuring that they reach every student's needs on an individual basis. This time, I am proud to totally introduce Jennifer Furman Bourne, Wendy Hale, and Kirsten Vera. Thank you so much, ladies, for being here. Greatly appreciate your attendance and looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you so much, Fran. I appreciate the introduction and welcome to everyone joining us today. Um, I'm going to share a little background about our team at Macaw. And while I'm doing that, I'd love for you to put your name and location into the chat so we can kind of see where everyone's from. Uh, it's super interesting to us as well when we're gathering in these platforms to see where everybody's from and uh, be able to collaborate and share ideas as well. So welcome again. Uh, today you're going to hear from myself, Jennifer Furman Bourne. I'm the principal at Macaw Steam Academy. I've got Kirsten Vera, an instructional strategist with me today, and Wendy Hale, an assistant principal. Ms. Hale, Ms. Vera, and myself have been the administrative team at Macaw for the past 10 years. Together, we've set the stage, transforming our low-achieving at-risk elementary school into a five-star high-achieving school that it is today. We transitioned the school into a STEAM school um, in year three. So um, year three was when we um, transitioned over to Magnet. So you're going to be wanting to ask the question, what did that do for us transitioning to becoming a Magnet school? And all I could say is that it gave us a little bit of confidence and empowerment. It brought us... Um, the growth mindset for high expectations for all. We had already set the stage of where we wanted to go, making sure that we put science and uh, into the forefront and making sure we really focused on that tier one instruction. Uh, we did not get money. It did grow our school from a school of about 450 students to about 750 that it is today. Um, the money we gained and the um, transitional supports we gained was through our student enrollment um, per people funding and a magnet coordinator position. All additional funding we gained was through community partnerships and grant writing. Um, our demographic population stayed the same. We continued to be a Title I. We grew that population, increasing our at-risk student base and our ethnic diversity. So yes, focusing on STEAM. Yes, STEAM makes everything easier. But adding that computer science really is a natural fit into the tier one core instruction. So whether you're a STEAM school or whether you are just um, uh, focusing on IB or whether you are focusing on just your tier one instruction, it is a natural fit into everything. Go ahead, Ms. Hale, and take us to the next slide. So computer science does multiple things. For us, we looked at it uh, simply as supporting creative expression and problem solving. We wanted to make sure we built that creativity, collaboration, and made sure we gave that flexibility to incorporate all of our thinkers um, and work together to build those digital skills aligned to that core standards. Everything we do and everything you'll hear from today is about going back to the core, that tier one instruction. Uh, no matter what you do extra and above and beyond, it's icing on the cake, it's um, a topper. Uh, but really, it goes back to that core and sticking and staying to that tier one and standards based instruction. Computer science is not going to go away. Our kids are immersed in a technology technological world um, and us as adults are just catching up to it. Uh, they are immersed in it from day one. <clears throat> Think of our young selves um, as we were growing up to suffer, discovering cassette recording as a kid or the portable Walkman or cordless telephones. And then, oh my goodness, when the phones, um, we got car phones, uh, it, it was like mind blowing. And think of what our reaction was from our parents and our grandparents. Um, who knows where technology is gonna lead us, but it is our job in education to try to keep up and integrate it instead of shunning it from instruction and trying to remove it. Computer science is embedded in virtually every area of academic study. Since the use of computer technologies, um, it has been an important part of creative expression 
and differentiating learning. How do we um, how do we tie it to our objectives? How are we going to embed these standards into our already compact day, right? Because time, 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 time. Everyone is stressing out with all of the new programs, all of the time, and everything that you have to do. So let's go on to the next slide. Let's talk about a focus on standards-based tier one instruction, that purposeful planning, those long range plans, a development of a framework to embed the content so it makes sense. So first of all, what is a silo? It's, it's removing the educational silos to get us all under one umbrella, right? Every, everything, instead of thinking, your day as departmentalized, as all spliced out into, I have to teach this little block, this block or this, you wanna pull it all together and integrate it. You need to, what's the intent or objective of teaching computer science? It's to aid in that development of students' early computer science skills, just the basics. So simple, right? You can do it, right? but it's equally as important in supporting that development of student personalized learning, okay? Because you really wanna differentiate so you can make sure every child is growing and every child has that opportunity. And through the personalization using computer science, students learn how computing skills will acquire the central skills to and through various systems and platforms to collaborate and putting projects together um, both as teams and independently. Go back to our COVID days and how we had to embrace that computer and that technology to get us through. Um, we are immersed in it 365 days a year. We are tied to our phones. So students learning in a computer science, it doesn't have to end at the end of the school day or the end of the school year. It's about making sure that we have that content available at our fingertips and how do we teach them to use it correctly? So if you keep it simple for them and you keep it simple for you, I think together that partnership is going to help you remove that silo and build it together um, and make it easier to digest and move forward. Go ahead and next slide, Ms. Hale. Thank you. Um, so let's take a few seconds to think about what comes to mind when you hear the word integration. It's multidisciplinary, it's cross-curricular, it's blended, it's combined, right? It's inclusive, right? It's basically taking that design and putting together your components of an effective lesson and taking instruction 10 notches higher and making it dynamic, right? Making it diverse, saving yourself time. It's not a worksheet, it's not a program, it's not even just following a textbook. It's not the status quo. It's what makes your teaching unique. It's what makes your style unique. It's what takes place in and outside of your classroom. So you have to start thinking integration in every facet from sciences, from a ELA, from writing, and how do you pull it and thread it all and make the most of your time. Integration is tough. It takes a lot of time and a lot of thought and collaboration. You have to talk through it with everyone and everybody around you. Um, through your home, when you're in the shower, thinking about what you need to do in that lesson plan and how you could have tied these two components together, writing yourself, uh, your future self a note. So when you come back to it the following year, you're like, oh my goodness, I remember thinking about that and now I can implement it because I wrote it down and I, I'm gonna have a plan to move forward. So how are you gonna do it? Where are you gonna start and how are you gonna fit it all in? Next slide, please. Well, you have the Nevada Computer Science and Integrated Technology Standards that are put out. There's many different ways your colleagues are able to utilize those instructional minutes to make sure that all students are taught computer science. You have multiple ways to embed and teach. What's gonna work for your school or team or you as a teacher? What's your style? What are ways that you have seen and heard about? So here's a list of just some different ways and different things that we've heard people are um, putting those ideas out um, by departmentalization, by um, 
making sure taking the librarian and the librarian is now pushing forward those computer science um, standards or specialists are sharing that opportunity to teach computer science humanities or computer science um, within a specialist schedule right um, doing that six day rotation um, or sometimes it's just a combination of everything uh, for us at macaw we are all about ownership owning the students that are in your classroom owning um, their skill set and differentiating for them every teacher every specialist from gate to special ed we own every child so for us it's about te teaching computer science in your own classroom across the entire school so it gives us the ownership of standards in the classroom that teacher and that ownership so we felt that was important once we pulled apart the standards and requirements so we could see that impact it has across all areas in the school. So even when that music teacher is diving in and using GarageBand to um, reconfigure a musical song with those fifth graders, he's able to refer to those digital citizenship. He's able to revert through that um, computer science. Even when that teacher is using those programs or Flipgrid or all those other tools that they're using in that classroom setting, they're able to speak that same dialogue in that same language. So across our school, we're saying the same things. Ms. Hale, next slide. Thank you. So reasons we integrate and how did we do it? Why did we do it? Time. Why is time always that problem in education? We always hear, we don't have enough time. How can we fit this in? What do we have to cut out to fit this in? We have such a short amount of time in a day. And why is education always stifled into putting into these scheduled time blocks and this mindset of individual education silos? So we had to find out very quickly here at Macaw that there isn't enough time to teach everything in isolation, that we have to look at our standards in a new learning path and start to integrate. When you integrate, you start to see your learning environment flip. You have more purposeful intent and you respect that time. A timeline in a day with a purpose helps you reach all the standards that need to be taught by intertwining and making those lessons more purposeful and more meaningful. Integration helps morph those lessons into learning targets with the addition of that computer science, helping them track their personalized data and helping them use those tools to present the data that they are learning and sharing. Mrs. Uh, Furman Bourne did talk about how technology and computer science changes over time so quickly. It empowers all of us to be creative and develop classrooms that are new it gives us access to new innovative resources. It aids us into being more effective leaders and helping all kids learn. It takes you out of those four walls in education, four walls in your classroom, and really drives those real world connections in which we will talk about later with Ms. Vera when you go on those virtual field trips and have those telepresence connections. That integration to technology and computer science is that powerful tool that all of our young generations crave and want. So we have to embrace it. They all want that phone in front of them in their classrooms. So if we have that tech in front of them, how do we use it to engage them into purposeful learning and leading them to success? So yes, integration is scary and you can fear that change as it may stifle you feeling like you can move forward, but actually it saves you time. And if you use it wisely, it engages your students. Okay, so here's some questions we asked our staff as we started our journey. Are we willing to adapt our approaches to reach our students and maximize instruction? Are we willing to give students structure yet choice? Are we willing for our students to productively struggle? 
not only our students, but ourselves? And are we okay with failing to learn? We had to start with our goals and how are we going to achieve them? How are we going to make computer science part of our forefront? Because science leads our way. So how does computer science tie in? We had to have that growth mindset. We had to take responsibility for improving our instruction. We had to take responsibility through our growth mindset for improving our practices. We had to take responsibility for our student learning and our student success. We had to understand that setbacks and feedback were opportunities to, to, to learn and grow. We had to actively seek out new paths in our dynamic lesson plan units. We had to tackle challenges with a positive mindset and we had to have the power to have to have the power of yet to set high expectations with our colleagues and students, but know that it would take failing forward to learn. We had to dive deep into computer science. We had to be willing to go head first and swim multiple strokes and styles using all the different tools we could get our hands on and our hands into, right? Jump in and there is so many things out there. Take it all and start to see where you're at. And so what do we mean by that failing forward? You have to learn to respect those failures and learn how to use those failures to make your lessons better. Apply those lessons to your future efforts. And even though those, those efforts may fail, your failure is going to bring you to your ultimate success. You cannot be scared of using that technology. You have to be ready to engage in it. You have to be ready to productively struggle with your students. How many of us get a new iPhone, an Android, a Windows phone, or the new Amazon Fire, or the latest lap, app, and read through the manual? <laughs> or how many of us just get in and start playing, start touching, start scrolling, start connecting, opening a thousand windows? So that productive being able to be, um, do a productive lesson plan needs to make sure that you just might fail forward or fall on your face and you try again, it's okay. So let's start our timeline. How do you even start? And everyone has to start somewhere. You need a vision and some determination. So as you have your growth mindset, and your new curriculum, you have to look at your environment. You need to look at your environment and set that stage, that physical stage for that learning integration in those computer sciences. What is comfortable from you, for you? And where do you start? Where is that process? It can take many years, but where do you start that's simple? Some classrooms start with their classroom environment your one-on-one, -on -one, your tech, does it sit in the back and never be utilized? Or is it out ready to be utilized at any time of the day for them to research, type, use as data, program, Flipgrid, do anything on that data as a tool? Does your environment space have extra hallways or unique environments that you can help transform into an exciting learning environment. We took classrooms and trans them, transformed them into labs focused on standards. We created spaces for robotics, coding, Mac labs, VR labs, portable green screens, claymation, flip grids, maker spaces, 3D printing. We started small, but we grew. Every utilized space has computer science attached to it. You can see a couple of our pictures up in our slides where we took a plain classroom and started to really morph it into space where students can utilize code and get their hands into computer sciences. So what spaces do you have around your campus? Indoor and outdoor, hallways, 
How does that computer science fit into your space? How do you set it up so that it's accessible for students to use as we do 24 hours a day? And when you get that tech into those hands of those students, you get that digital citizenship going right away. That's where we started. And we started with that blended learning where they receive immediate feedback to data that connects and they can share with others. So what does the integration look across our school community? Our standards drive instruction and we tweak our long range plans, but science is the forefront of our standards. It is not a reading basil, it is science standards. And we connect those science standards to our reading, to our writing, and to our computer sciences. It helps lend those computer sciences being implemented daily and it gives that elegant fit to even the arts. Our computer science plays a significant role throughout our classrooms, day in and day out, because today we live in a digital era. It is not isolated because today in our digital era, we use it and we are impacted by technology and computer science, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. So technology will impact our students daily, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. And it helps them transform into that new and learning environment. We all have that one-on-one -on -one tech and it's starting to revolutionize how we learn, how quick we learn, how fast we get our hands on data, how fast we get feedback and how fast we can actually put a student on an individual learning path. They are going quicker than we are. So we have to facilitate that tech and computer science and utilize it all the time. Tech is in all industries, such as education, healthcare, communications, scientific research. It is in all. So all needs to be all. That means our special education students, our GATE students, and even our specialists. They are utilizing computer science in all lesson opportunities that integrate and helps with those um, standards. We also use it in some PBLs and scaffolded supports, which we will talk about later on in this presentation. Also, our computer sciences are supported through our communities and collaborations, which you will see more as well towards the end. So the how, how do we plan this all out and how do we map it? Who do you start with? You start with your team, you start with your grade level teachers, you start with your coaches, your magnet coordinators, your SPED, your GATE, your admin and your art, music, PE, library specialists, PE, all who are app applicable, all. And you look at those long range plans. We do it two times a year and we work through science as our forefront tied to those computer sciences. Weekly, we have our PLCs and we communicate an IDA daily on how we can reach those students to make it more engaging. We reflect and revise and tweak our dynamic instruction units. We have project-based learning and we also have instructional units tied to the sciences and our computer sciences. Computer science standards are in alignment into our framework and we work on developing either Google Slides with the Gate Strategist or finding partners throughout the community such as Fat Brain, Toys and Shark Tank members as we integrate. So I'm gonna show you a little bit more. We don't have that magical template, but we collaborate and make sure that it is intentional. Whether you have a canvas, 
a Google, a Moodle, a shared folder, paper, wherever you can start, you start to take those components and you start a dynamic unit lesson or a PBL that's accessible to all so that they can get those hands on that tech. You have that support. We have several documents that are um, organized vertically as you get better, K through five. And we help plan those dynamic lessons so that when kids are getting their hands on that computer tech, they're not all doing the same. So once we got our science labs and our robots and our field trips and our community partners, we had to make sure that our snapshot and our overarching map let students grow with the tech. So we started our school with something very, very simple. We started off with a dash and dot and we grew from dash and dot to BBOTS and we grew from BBOTS to VEX robots and we grew from VEX robots to VR codes and we grew from those to now telepresence and talking to other people on the other side of the country and on the other side of the states so that kids are excited to engage in curriculum and science throughout the school year. So I'm going to hand it off to Ms. Vera. She is going to talk about how we have grown and give you lots of ideas of what our computer science looks like today. All right, so you're probably wondering how to incorporate computer science into your curriculum. How about using virtual field trips to strengthen ties to your community and provide nationwide opportunities for your students? Everyone in CCSD has new display panels. How can you use them to meet your computer science standards? You basically have a giant computer on your wall. By adding a webcam, you can now engage with others outside your classroom. One way to do this is through virtual field trips and using telepresence to engage with guest speakers. Um, here are some examples of some field trips and guest speakers that we collaborate with. Our first grade does Habitat Explorers with the Boston Museum of Science. Our second grade does the virtual tours of Ellis Island. Our third grade does Columbia State Park and Q&A with park rangers. Our fourth grade does Grand Canyon, Don Memorial State Park, Red Rock Canyon with park rangers. And our fifth grade is Extraction to Protection Program at Point Lobos and then a live Q&A session with the park ranger. And they also meet with engineers from Fat Brain Toys to launch their toys PBL. And that's all through um, virtual field trips. Um, we can go ahead to the next slide. All right, so robotics is a great way to incorporate algorithm and programming standards. We developed a plan to integrate robotics. We decided to assign robots to each grade level, starting with the easiest to program and progressively getting more difficult. Our objective was to expose each grade level to progressively more complicated robots and coding opportunities, starting with the basic beginning lessons to teach each robot at each level. And after that, aligning our robotics to our PBLs. So our kindergartners use the cubelets, First grade use dash, dash and dot. Second and third grade use Ozobots. Fourth and fifth grade use Spheros. And our competition clubs use Mindstorms and Vex. So for example, our third grade students use the Ozobots during their rainforest unit. The Ozobot represents a rainforest animal that they've researched. They create a rainforest setting and program the Ozobot to avoid obstacles in the rainforest layers. They may program the Ozobot to speed by a predator or make turns to go around a puddle. Our first graders program Dash to play a certain tune on a xylophone for their sound and light unit. The newest one we are planning is using Ozobots in second grade for their Macy's Day Parade engineering project. So we're always adding new things um, when we can, but we started off small and we progressively um, get more in depth with what we're doing with robots. We can go on to the next slide. Here's our virtual reality. So exposing our students to virtual reality and 3D printing provides another way to show students that computer science is more than just computer programming. 
Exposing them to these types of tools will help our students become successful in the digital world. When Ms. Hale asked the question, what does it mean to fail forward? What it means to our staff is basically not being afraid to fail when trying to teach something new and practicing what we preach when we teach the engineering design progress um, process to students. We had to practice this when teaching our first VR lessons. And first we rolled it out to our staff, as you can see in the picture at the top. Um, you can see the picture of our staff enjoying VR. And then we asked them the question, how can we incorporate the standards to engage students in meaningful play in a way that links your content to ELA science and computer science standards? We risked failure the first time we tried VR in the classroom, and we might have had about three cases of motion sickness. But regardless, the kids were engaged and they loved it. I almost fell off a cliff. So that was really fun when I got to play with the VR. But yes, very, very um, informative of the play. They feel it as, as play, but it, when it's time to the moon or a standard, it is so powerful. We had a kiddo come running to school on a Monday morning because they knew that their classroom was going to get to go to the moon. And how did that little kid get to go to the moon who lives in an apartment across the street and hardly ever gets outside of that apartment? Through their virtual reality. That kid had a moment in time where their excitement for school, connection to standards, and an opportunity that some students will never have with a VR system in computer science is something that they'll never forget. All right, we can go to the next slide. All right, so using Google Sites and Slides provides a great way to hit data and analysis standards. It can be as simple as using Google Slides or as complex as creating Google Sites. Students become proficient in organizing and presenting data and research through Google Sites. We've created Google Sites for our PBLs at our school, and it's a great way to teach from distance if necessary. Um, I'm not sure, Ms. Hale, if we have enough time to maybe look at one of these. Yeah, okay. So if you can click on the Point Lobos, I'm gonna show you really quickly um, kind of what these Google Sites look like. All right, and then so we have our driving question, all of our um, icons are here for depth and complexity. And then Ms. Hale, if you can click on the hook up at the top, if you look up at the top, yep, click that. Now, this is where our students meet with uh, Ranger Daniel. So Ms. Hale, if you can just quickly click on that link, let's see if it opens. So this is where our students are actually getting to meet with Ranger Daniel over at Point Lobos. And this part is actually built into our um, Google Sites, but later they will go in and actually have Q&A with him and see him live while he's there. And so you can do like amazing things with um, Google Sites and then all of your curriculum is in one place for your PBL and for your unit, it's all linked. The kids can open all of their documents from here. They can save all of their, um, their writings and if they, cre they create public service announcements and all of that is linked into these Google um, sites. So it's pretty powerful. You have your driving questions, your vocabulary, you have your evaluation and everything um, linked into these Google sites. So we have Google sites for uh, fifth grade for toys, for Point Lobos and for our Patriot um, PBLs. For fourth grade, we have it for roller coasters. For third grade, we have it for climate zones and for the gold rush, um, flooding and for their rainforest units. Third grade tends to stick with slides um, for right now, but um, we're trying to move those slides over into Google sites as we go. So think about it, embrace the learning and hard work that you did over the pandemic. How did you teach? You did a lot of these video type things. Where are those video links? How can you embed and use them now to support your face-to-face -face instruction? Can you use them for reteaching, for tier two, for students that might've missed your lessons due to absences? The Google sites are a great way to, um, to do that and to reach any kids that um, 
if you ever have to do anything virtually or from a distance. All right, next slide. All right, so here is a program we use to launch and teach us. If you've had, if you have funds or if you need a program to support you through the process, this is a great resource um, to hit many standards in a very um, linear format. So this is Engineering is Elementary. Um, it introduces computer science and engineering concepts to children and helps them develop a foundational understanding of the world around them and explore how to improve it. Exposure to both subjects in elementary grades ensures more equity in learning as children start to gain awareness and interest in STEAM and STEM. So you can see it has um, for first grade, they're designing lighting systems and program, um, programming the B-Bots. Um, they do an Omar's robotic reach. Second grade designs hand pollinators and creates animations with Scratch Jr. Um, Mariana becomes a butterfly. She um, shares a B idea. Um, they design maglev systems and build automated systems with micro bits and micro coding. Um, and you can see it goes on. So that's a really good research to, uh, resource to use if you're just starting. All right, Ms. Hale, you can go on to the next. So technology has had an enormous impact on student learning. It's only right that we as educators begin to teach our students how to engage and participate in responsible ways of using technology. So we all know we're not the experts. And my goodness, we're showing you a lot of amazing things. But let me tell you, when Ms. Hale talked about, uh, spoke about failing, we failed. There are some times where it was we would ask the teachers to invite administration in to watch them do it for the first time just to take that pressure off of yourselves, just to watch the chaos, because it's hard. You have to work at it. You have to experiment. You have to work on your pacing. You have to be willing to fail in order to succeed. We know and realize the importance of computer science and the great impact that software programs and computers have on not only education, but on everyone's social and emotional being. So because of this, it's so important that we collaborate and we encourage others to expand their technological knowledge to make sure we keep up with that challenging world. We encourage you guys to ask questions. We do. I know in the chat, I've been kind of monitoring it. We do have tours. We have tours all the time for people coming to want to see our school. And we love to go out and see other schools as well. And we love to collaborate with other people and schools because it's all about that collaboration and that working together so that we can all integrate as much as we can to make it a dynamic um, classroom for these kids these days. So we thank you for participating today and best of luck as you continue to grow and integrate the successful um, computer science standards launch and all, along with all of the other programs that you are using and that tier one instruction that you are working so hard to deliver um, each and every day. So thank you and uh, we will open it up for some questions. So if you have anything, you can either put them in the chat or you can unmute and ask away. There are a couple of questions about grants. Yes, we have written some grants um, for um, our computer science supports. Um, Jen, you wanna talk a little bit about some of the grants we wrote? Um, I know that we did a couple for our outside hydroponic systems and learnings, um, and then a few of our computer science sciences. The State Department has a bunch as well. Um, if you're looking to become a STEM school, they're always offering um, funding. There's just all those mini grants and donors choose that are out there. It's just about what you write it for. So being creative and how you, um, what you want to ask for. Uh, and a lot of times um, people want to fund, they want to fund those B bots, right? They want to fund those fun projects for those kids. And it's, it's the hard stuff. It's the paper pencil stuff that they don't want to fund, right? So it's usually pretty simple if you're looking to get a classroom set of something or in the VR. And yeah, it looks expensive. It's really not that expensive anymore. So it's well worth an investment. And um, to once you get that classroom set uh, and being able to launch it, even webcams there, I mean, everything, the prices have just gone down tremendously. So it's very affordable. Uh, Ms. Furmanborn, we have a good question from Don Sullivan. 
It said, uh, she says, with district-wide curriculum and visions amplified, do you find it's been an extra challenge integrating STEAM and computer science since you've already established an innovative curriculum? I thought I'd throw that out to you because <laughs> we talk about this all the time, right? We're always talking about it and we're always talking about the district acronyms and what is being launched and what is being um, pushed forward. Uh, we, uh, yes and no. So, uh, math is very difficult to integrate um, math because of the way it spirals and uh, the way the standards are. It kind of almost sits a little bit on its own island. There's a lot of bridges that we connect to it, but we kind of allow that to kind of flow. Um, uh, I don't want to say in isolation, but um, pretty much it has to have that path in order to make sure that you get that spiraling and you're able to hit all those standards before you have that testing. Um, as far as the uh, Amplify and all the other, we really are standards driven. So we take our standards and if Amplify is what hits those standards, then Amplify is what we use. If FOSS is what hits those standards, then FOSS is what we use. So we really look at the standards. We really look at what is going to be best to meet those standards. And uh, we spoke about it earlier about how we take science first when planning, because science is the most difficult one to fit in. And if you are looking to try to say, ELA and fit science into ELA, um, it, it it's patchy at best, right? So, but if you start with science, there's so many great exemplars and so many great texts that you can use nonfiction and fiction that work together to support that science. Um, so we found that that was really a lot easier to work backwards with that um, when we're building those long range plans. Right, and when, um, like, for example, when we do the Point Lobos, for fifth grade, the students are reading Island of the Blue Dolphin, and they're tying that in a fiction, you know, a fiction read, but they're tying that into Point Lobos. And so pretty much with all of our PBLs, we have exemplars that go with them. Um, and that's how we integrate the ELA into the science. Right, which is, con um, then they also do a presentation through their flip grids with you know green screens and backgrounds and costumes and they get to present to um, the ranger at the end. Or you saw the shark tank and when they go through the engineering process, they uh, get to present to the shark tank as well. So there's some exciting ideas to make that learning exciting. Um, and then I just wanted to say, yes, it's a lot cheaper now. VR, our VRs to update them for the whole year with a ton of curriculum and standards is $350. So very cheap and accessible to even a small classroom to write a small grant um, or a donor's choose to get your VR systems in and be able to get curriculum on it for the year. Yeah, and nobody, none of us knew how to do VR when we first got it. We just like, okay, we're, we have, we've got this now. Now we've got to try to figure out how to do it, you know? And so one of us would jump on the computer and like, oh, this is how, you know, and kind of play around with it. And then that's how we took that and then took it to our staff, you know, and then from there, who wants to jump on board and who has a, a great fit with something that's already on the VR system that's gonna fit in with um, what they're doing, what their standards are and kind of working from there and not being afraid to fail. We had, uh, we went on a tour once and uh, in at a school and one of the things that they were doing, they called it geek out and mess around is that they would take a technology, one of their tools, like whether it's the VR, whether it's the cubelets, whatever they were trying to work through and learn as a staff, and they would take it to happy hour with them. And so they were able to sit and play with it and immerse themselves into it in a fun experience and a fun way without having that stress of uh, 20 students staring at you like, you know, what are we doing today? And then nothing has worked and you realize that you just forgot to charge them. Right. So um, so figure out ways that make it so it's less stressful or like we said, when you're not afraid to fail after testing is over and you're done and you're looking for those um, celebrations with your class. That's something we do as well. We do not do extra recess. All of our celebrations are tied to that tier one instruction and those standards, and we just try to make it a learning experience for them. So we um, using technology and some of these robots and different things is a great way to say, hey, you've earned a reward, right? But you're still tying it to your standards. You're still doing stuff with it. What? 
Especially when you're launching and you're getting to get to go for a hike. She can help me all that. Oh, somebody's got their mic off. <clears throat> but yeah, so it's it's just about experimenting. It's about like really being open to it and making sure you really are watching that pacing and you're not afraid to integrate it. That is the key. If you can integrate it into your writing and you can integrate it into your ELA, then you're gonna feel more comfortable. And that's even with science, even with launching Amplify, really making sure that you're putting that into um, your day already and not isolating everything. And we started with 10 years ago, the hour of code. And now our kids are coding all the time with graphic or organizers and getting ready to like Miss Vera said, tie it to their rainforest and code their Ozobots through a rainforest that they have designed. And it's just turned into a very powerful integration of the computer sciences. And our kindergartners use that tool. They open up multiple windows. They can show their data. They can open up windows and show what books they have read and what percentages they've gotten on. And our first and second graders are starting to open up windows and type. And so it's just a great tool to have all the time at their fingertips. So um, to wrap it up, a couple last minute questions that came in um, uh, about um, what if it, not everyone's on board? Not everyone is ever gonna be on board. I, that is like a dream. Even when we have um, amazing, uh, we're still trying to relaunch. If you're sitting comfortable, then you're not being innovative and you're not moving forward. So even in our teams, even with our PBLs, we're constantly reviving, revising, we're constantly adding to it. That's something that when Ms. Vera was talking about the Google Slides or the um, Google Sites that the teams created, all of those resources from every great mind of each teacher in that department and in that grade level team has their materials embedded in that. So it's up to them the how and what is your demographics of your classroom makeup look like, how you deliver that content. So those higher, if you have a class that's like high thinkers, then you can scaffold that up and use the tools that are at a little bit higher level. If you have maybe those uh, special education inclusion students, you might need to scaffold down. So, but putting those all in that bank and in that resource, so you can pick and choose and you can use what you're gonna use to deliver your instruction with, or what you're going to reteach with if your kids miss that concept is a great tool as well to bringing everyone on board and sharing and collaborating. Um, so, and growing um, that resource uh, so that you can kind of have your independence, but also be all on that same path tied to that summative assessment. Um, we, we started also with after school enrichment clubs. So with our tutoring, that was another great uh, way for teachers to feel comfortable with bringing in some of these tools and kind of playing with them with the kids and engaging with it. So that was another way to kind of, kind of ease it in um, to what you were doing. We also allowed them to buddy up. So we would take the robots and go outside. If you don't have enough space in your classroom to kind of pair up with the buddy teacher, then we would let you guys go out together you find a space that was large enough to kind of work together as a team to deliver it. Yes, our school is the one that has the mine. We have the Macaw School of Mines attached to our campus. <clears throat> what VR system do you guys use? I am not sure what VR system. Ms. Vera, do you know what VR system we have? I was, I was just on it yesterday and I was trying to remember what it was. Um, if you want to email me, I will get back to you with the answer to that. If you have any other questions, you can always email any three of us too um, for tours or questions about anything that we're doing. Um, you can email us and we'll get back to you. I think our emails are on the screen right there. I will get back to you on the uh, VR system. But thank you so much for all of your time and your questions today and good luck with the rest of your school year. Hopefully um, the weather starts warming up down here and it warms up up north for you guys as well. Thank you so much, Jennifer and Wendy and Kirsten. I really appreciate you sharing that, especially as everyone knows, K-5 computer science standards has been required by the state since 2020. And for uh, the Clark County School District, in case for those educators who may not be aware, it will be on every elementary school report card starting next year. 
There are currently 12 schools piloting it and next year computer science will be on every elementary report card. So all of these amazing ideas are great ways to incorporate those standards and be prepared to share those as well. Thank you everyone for attending. Again, thank you, Jennifer and Kirsten and Wendy for your presentation, which is phenomenal. I'm sure you'll be receiving a lot of communication from individuals who attended and maybe some others who didn't have the opportunity to attend, but we'll get information from them as well. Thank you so much. Please remember to complete the um, session survey. And in order to make sure that you're prepared for your next session, you can go ahead and complete the survey and then leave the room so that you can go ahead and attend the next session that starts at 1025. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your time and enjoy the rest of the conference.